I think there's, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. The first is um, members will be aware that there's acute attention um, across the country on the caesarean section rate. Um, we know it, it's increasing. Um, we know it's the commonest in hospital surgical procedure in Canada. Um, and, and we know there's multiple attempts um, across the country um, to, to look at the reasons why that is. Um, one of those categories um, that there's also the perception that it's contributing to this, although nobody really knows exactly how much, um, is caesarean section by request, so-called uh, caesarean section on demand or caesarean section by request. Um, and we don't think it's contributing a lot to this increase, but we know from our members that it, it is something that they come across in their practice. Um, and uh, it is, seems to be that um, the, the frequency that um, they, their, their members are, are receiving this request is increasing. So they came to us saying, well, okay, um, how do, what's, the best, what's our best approach to this? So we thought um, with that environment, we, sh we should produce something to guide the members and the public um, on this topic. I think obstetricians and maternity providers in Canada really like to practice within the standards of care and without a formal statement from the SOGC, there was a lot of uncertainty on are we supportive of this, are we not supportive, can we have the conversation um, and there's a lot of emphasis right now on cesarean sections and attempts to lower cesarean section rates. I think it was a big black box for practitioners and it's nice to have some support and some guidance from the national body on what are appropriate uh, actions when women ask for it primary like the cesarean section. I'm not sure if it's truly an increased demand, but a more openness in terms of discussing how we're going to get a baby out of a woman. Um, I work with a population that has an older maternal population and women having fewer babies, and so the role of cesarean section may be different in different populations. Um, I think women are getting much better educated outside of just their maternity care providers about what their options are. And so I think women may not, there may not be more women wanting this, but I think there's more women who actually feel comfortable to bring up the conversation. Well, we don't exactly know in Canada. I don't think there's been a, a, a very good widespread um, study looking at that particular um, question. But we know from our members that some of it relates to um, a, a, a fear of the actual labor process. Some of the reasons behind it is, is a concern regarding pelvic floor damage. Some of it's related to um, you know, the need to schedule or the modern lifestyle need to control. The labor and birth is a very un, uh, unexpected, perhaps uncontrollable event. And, 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 and some of it is related to that. It's a wide variety. I think there's some women who really do have a fear of labor. They heard traumatic stories, they're concerned about the integrity of bladder or bowel, and they just really want to avoid labor. I think there's a lot of women that fall more into the gray zone of uncertainty and need for control. And it's not always as black and white as, is there a medical indication or not, but rather, is there a medical indication to go straight to cesarean section? And sometimes we're talking, comparing to an induction of labor versus spontaneous onset of labor. And I often find that some of the women asking for cesarean section are actually asking to have some degree of control over a natural physiological process for which they don't always have control of. And they're not always explicitly asked, even though they start out explicitly asking for cesarean section, what they're hoping to get from the conversation may not be a cesarean section, but some degree of control over the process. But uh, we don't really know, and, and I think that's important. We, we can't assume we know what's behind any woman's request, and that's one of the, the things in the guidelines is that um, in, in addition to explaining risks and benefits, is, it, is, an, is, an, is a discussion to the woman um, as to what's behind that. And often um, a request is really an invitation to start opening a discussion on the birth process rather than a, a, a certain request to, to give birth by cesarean. Um, I think it was always probably there, but I think as cesarean sections are being more commonplace and uh, our cesarean section rate across the country is 30%, people are just becoming used to it as a method of birth mm -hmm. and not an unavoidable calamity of birth. And so, so therefore, because it's acceptable and because it is very safe and because so many people um, are giving birth by it and seem to do very well, um, women now have, uh, see that as a, as, a, as a potential option. Um, which they can bring forward, which before I think it was always regarded as a, 
as a failure of the birth process. And now it's because of the increasing incidence, I think, is in the public, it's part of an acceptable accompaniment to the birth process, which I think is behind why it's perhaps more commonly found. I think there's a huge push right now about addressing cesarean section rates and some uncertainty about what optimal cesarean section rates should be and so any sort of promotion or support for easier access to c-section may seem counterintuitive to that plan um, there's also a drive for encouraging vaginal delivery and i think the conflict is is we really do support patient autonomy but we have the other voices arguing for lower C-section rates, reducing costs, and we're not sure exactly where the maternal request C-section fits into the entire picture. I think the first step is really sort of delving into the, what is she hoping to get from, from going down this pathway? Is there something particular she's hoping to get from a C-section as opposed to a planned vaginal delivery? Sometimes I find it's actually more about the timing of delivery than the actual mode of delivery. It is very important though that we really clarify what her goals are and identify what the risks and benefits are to herself but also to her child. And it is still important to address the issue about what are the risks to future pregnancies and how many future pregnancies are we likely to see for this woman. We still think as a society that um, by and large we should reserve cesarean sections for cases where it's indicated. Um, um, and uh, however, what we also recognize is that with this increased request for cesarean section, there is a concept of, of patient autonomy and that if, if the reasons behind um, the patient's request has been explored thoroughly, um, if people are fully informed about the potential benefits and risks, um, and for that particular woman, again, what's behind that request for her, if that persists and there's a well thought out reason and request to do it, then patient autonomy has to come into it. And so that's, um, I don't think that's new. I think the SOGC has always had patient autonomy as a very important principle. And we also have a principle of, you know, first do no harm, and that this is a, a surgical procedure which, which really should be reserved for in normal circumstance uh, medical reasons. On the other hand, um, it can be considered, and if, if an approach comes from a patient, um, it's not to say that you should routinely offer it, if, a person, if an approach comes from a patient and it's fully explored and they understand and you are willing to do this, then it's something that's not out of the bounds of acceptable practice. If on the other hand, as a physician, you don't think it's safe for the patient or you, you can't do it, then as most of us in Canada who work in, in this uh, provincial or this national health system, then we have an obligation to refer that patient um, uh, on to a, a practitioner who perhaps does feel that they could do this procedure for them. So short-term race, it is still a surgical procedure. We often talk about the risk of infection, injury to other organs, including bladder and bowel, blood vessels, uh, higher rates of infection. Uh, there is more bleeding when cutting into an organ that has a large amount of blood going to it. There are maternal risks such as uh, blood clots, DVT. Uh, Short-term fetal risk may include some questions about uh, early exposure to bacteria. Without the onset of labor, we have to be cautious about doing these C-sections before 39 weeks. Um, lifetime risks, so C-sections of abdominal surgery. There are long-term risks associated with abdominal surgery that may have to do with future bowel adhesions, risk to future pregnancies. Uh, it's a bit confounding by the indication for the previous C-section, but the risk of an invasive placenta or placenta creta is really an important discussion point and the number of pregnancies that a woman wishes to have is a very important part of this discussion. I think it's very clear that we need to be speaking with the patients and really understanding their motivations, but if we feel at the end of the day that we're not comfortable supporting this choice, we do need to provide her access to alternative providers to, to review this as well to make sure it's not our bias uh, getting in the way of her, her choice. I think that the physician, um, that the physician cannot abandon the patient. The physician should then um, refer the patient to a place where um, that, that the patient's autonomy could be respected in a physician that would be able to do it. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't address what happens if there's no one in that particular area and the patient has to travel beyond there. It doesn't, it, I don't think it fully encompasses everything that can happen. But in, in general principles, that's what the physician should attempt to do for that patient, assuming that all the other uh, criteria have, have been met.
Um, I think the physician's role is to help her navigate the system just because I may not feel comfortable with a particular choice. Um, we need to help women access the right care provider. There are online support groups for these women and they are talking among themselves. They know which obstetricians in which cities are more comfortable with this choice. Um, and so knowing where to direct them for resources if, if you're not comfortable doing that. Elective cesarean sections are really difficult to study because predominantly people I think have been a bit nervous to actually write on their chart, I'm doing this as a maternal request C-section without medical indication. I think there's been a bit of fear from the obstetrician to say, if I write that, am I going to be penalized for that? The actual sort of electiveness of the cesarean section is quite variable. I've had women who've had cardiac disease who are candidates for assisted second stage, which means a high probability of a force of their vacuum delivery, who have elected for a cesarean section it's arguable how elective that was because she wasn't comparing it to a spontaneous vaginal delivery. She was comparing it to a forceps assisted uh, delivery. But I think now that we have a statement that says, this is something that we can discuss, this is something we can do, I think there'll be less fear of penalty for the obstetrician to write, this was a maternal request C-section, and we may now actually be able to start collecting that data. Since we start, since I was involved in the writing this, if I had the odd cesarean section that was for this indication, I have very clearly written that as the indication because I think without better data, we can't actually provide truly appropriate informed consent to these women. But there are some data. There is a, there's a publication in Birth from 2009 from Australia. There's a UK study uh, amongst uh, medical medical practitioners requesting cesarean section. I think about eight percent of female UK doctors requested it. So, and and some of the perceptions are there in Canada. I think there's an opportunity. Um, for somebody in a, in a region or a network to say, okay, this is, let's, let's start categorizing, let's collect the data, let's investigate, so that we know exactly you know, what are the main reasons behind the consent. Because right now, I don't think we know that they have exact incidents, and it, it might not be correctly recur recorded because perhaps there's been this perception that it's the wrong thing to do, so perhaps the different indications being put down on the record because people have not not been comfortable to put, oh, this is a request, and you know what, I'm okay to do this. Yeah. So I think now with the guideline being published and people um, people needn't be afraid or embarrassed to say, well, this is what I'm doing, I think now there's an opportunity to, to study it further, both, um, by, uh, both in terms of what's underlying it and in terms of the outcomes as well. I think this is where maternity care is such a fascinating place to work. There's very little that we do in the whole reproductive field that doesn't carry economic or ethical debates from contraception, to termination of pregnancy. I think it's an absolutely fascinating ethical, ethical debate that women can choose when and if they want to get pregnant, they can choose if they continue the pregnancy, they can choose the level of care provider they want, where they want to deliver home versus a hospital or a community setting. But up until this point, we've been really reluctant to discuss women's discussions and women's ability to choose how they deliver. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a straightforward opinion because, as you can imagine, there's, there's different ethical principles involved, especially in a, in, a, in a publicly funded healthcare system in terms of cost, in terms of resource and impact, in terms of the principle of, 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 a, of an obstetrician, you know, premium non nocere, to first do no harm, and, then, and we know that the risk, maternal risk, short term, perhaps is increased. By, by section number one. So um, you have to weigh all those um, decisions versus the autonomy. And there, there, is, there is lots of literature about this ethical debate. So um, it, it took almost um, almost a year and a half to get this through, even though it's a one and a half page document, and even though the, mm -hmm. the facts are pretty simple um, in terms of risks benefits, they're in the literature. Um, but the, to get people to a place of, of comfort with the final guideline, the board, and all the subcommittees, it did take some, a lot of thought behind it. I think it's really a gateway to say it's safe to have this discussion. I think in the past, when there was no sort of formal support, it wasn't clear as an obstetrician whether or not I could even entertain this discussion with a woman without having the support of my colleagues in my national body. And now it's quite clear that let's have the discussion. And I'm often surprised where the discussion leads. The majority of women I've seen in consultation requesting a maternal request C-section haven't ultimately booked a C-section.
but I think the process by which their needs were heard and discussed and education was shared with them, they feel much safer moving forward with the process and they feel very respected by the process.